some years back there was a book whose title I'm going to forget, but uh, was very controversial because it argued that what parents do when they raise their kids is really not that important. It's basically peer group. Peer group influence matters much more than what the parents are going to do, and I, this, this caused great controversy at the time. And I think a, uh, much of what you were saying in your essay is actually tapping into this question. This book was written, I think, before social networking became such a huge force in the lives of, of the young. So the question I have for you is um, about moderation and balance. How do we strike a balance now, given, given the 24-7 saturation in media that, that kids are raised with these days, um, between adult influence, including in character building and all the things, all the values we want to raise our kids to have, and their peer group, who are just as lost as they are in terms of figuring this stuff out. And how do you see the media, um, and specifically television, playing into that? It's extremely difficult uh, because the vigilance required for parents to uh, monitor all the feedback, the streams coming into young people's lives. It's, it's beyond uh, what, what they can handle. Uh, and, and part of the problem is that this is a, an entirely new situation in the history of civilization. And you have to go back a hundred years to see the process beginning. Uh, and, and the process is socialization during during the teenage years. In, in 1910, 100 years ago, the percentage of high school age Americans who were in high school was about 9 or 10 percent. Only 1 in 10 were there in a high school. The vast, vast majority of Americans left school in 5th, 6th, 7th grade, and what did they do? They went to work. They worked on the family farm. They worked in the family shop, or they worked in, as, as a clerk in someone else's shop. They worked in a factory. Child labor was, was, was very popular, uh, which meant that during their teenage years, they were under the direct scrutiny and control of adults. They did not have a social life. There was no social life for teenagers, except a very tiny percentage of them. When they would meet, it would be after church. It would be at a neighborhood gathering, a picnic, and adults were always around. There was no chance to build up any continuity of peer, peer interaction. You jump ahead 50 years to 1960, and now you have, suddenly, uh, you know, 75, 80% of high school age adults are in high school, which means that about 185 days a year, you're packing a thousand of them into one building. You're, they have lockers right next to one another. They're mingling in the halls. They're going from room to room in groups of 30. They're eating in the same place. They're going to gym class. They're showering together. A lot of them have after school activities, band and, and, and sports. And then they're hanging out for a while at the mall or, or in cars. And you have the, the teenager. You have something called peer pressure. There was no such thing as peer pressure in 1920. Now you've got it because of these circumstances. You're putting all these 15 and 16, 17 year olds together with one another, and the logical thing happens. All the tribalisms of high school come into play. The, the cliques and the in crowd, the out crowd, the shunning, the bullying, and, and so on. But it had a limit when they went home. There was a landline, which, which as it's now called, you might talk to one person for, but you can only talk to one person at a time. Um, and you were mostly exposed to your parents. You had to listen to the TV. You had to, you know, in my household, Walter Cronkite droning on about <laughs> Vietnam. I didn't want to listen to that. I didn't want to talk to my parents. I didn't like them. And, you know, I, you know and, and, and uh, but I couldn't check out. I couldn't go like this under the table. Right? During dinner, I had to over here talk about you know, the class of finances and house and, and, and Watergate and, and, and my parents hating Nixon. So, uh, uh, but that was a transition into today where it's a 24 7. You know, Pew researchers in their, in their last study of youth found they were, they were astounded at the number of, number of teenagers who sleep with the cell phone under their pillow in the on position. 
They want to be awakened if a text message comes through. And Nielsen came up with the average text messages per month for teens with cell phones is 3,339 per month. So it's a nonstop teen world. And, and it's, it's almost a, you know, this is too new, this, this transition into independent adolescence. This, this, it's, just like our, it's like culture hasn't caught up with this to understand how, how to adapt to this. And, and, when, when, and when I give talks and people ask, OK, what do we do? You know, maybe there's, we'll disagree over the extent of this problem, but what do we do? And I go, oh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have anything except to say, you know, parents have to institute things like reading hour or, you know, or, or you know, non-social hour. You know, it could be watching C-SPAN or, you know, lis listening, something that would draw them for an hour out of the, the social contact, expose them into this world they're supposed to grow into. I, mean, I, I have a six-year-old, and if I, I, I spend an hour of reading time with him, and we go back and forth between the, the Odyssey and Captain Underpants, you know, we're negotiating these things. <laughs> uh, then if he wants to go back and watch, you know, dinosaurs eating each other on the internet, that's fine. If I get that critical mass, that hour in, I think it's, it's, it's okay getting some balance of, of pulling him away from youth stuff. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's what I see the answer, but it's very hard. I mean, a, you know, a, a middle school principal in New Jersey uh, a while back sent a letter home to all the parents. This, this even made, made the network news. Get your kids off of Facebook. And I'm not talking about, you know, predators. He said the things our middle schoolers are doing to each other over Facebook, you know, completely overshadows any dangers about adults. And he said, our school counselors are now spending 75% of their time with social networking problems. And in the last eight cases, it was all Facebook. And when we called the parents at home and we said, you got to get your, your child, he's doing this on Facebook. Five out of the eight said, my child doesn't have a Facebook account. Wrong. You know, your child does. So kids will be kids. They, they, they find ways to get around the, the, the parental control. And digital technology certainly has made it easier and easier. So it's the vigilance. And the parents have to you know, get in that one hour a day and uh, uh, understand something new has happened in their lives. It's quite different from when you were young. It's all changed. When, you're, when your mom said to you when you were 13, go to your room, you're grounded, that meant isolation. You're, you're by yourself and you're gonna reflect on your bad behavior. Now, go to your room, you're grounded. Well, there's the laptop is in there, the, the Blackberry, the, the, room, the, the bedroom is a social hub. Okay? It's a control center. They can, they, can, they can shut the door and screen out the rest of the house and open up to the rest of the world, uh, all of their friends. That's a completely different condition than when their parents were kids. So it's sort of bringing that awareness and, and to say, you've got to act more actively, more proactively, to draw your children out of the peer network for a time, okay, for a time. Then they can go back to it. This, um, this is excellent advice. My only concern, and this is my follow-up question, um, is that uh, the adults are equally enmeshed in Facebook. There's a term retrosexual. These are people who, because Facebook is like National Enquirer for high school if you're over the age of 30, basically it's going back and seeing all the people you went to high school with. Um, and uh, people hook up with old boyfriends and girlfriends from high school, ergo they become retrosexuals. So the question I have is that, um, you know, there have been a couple of studies of just media use as a culture that we have. Um, and the constant, the, the corrosive effects of this steady, steady stream of information at all hours. And the phrase alone together, which recently was used by um, Sherry Turkle at MIT as the title of her new book, strikes me as being part of the problem because the parents are also using these technologies to further isolate. But when we think about it in terms of pop culture, it's also become normalized, right? I mean, 
how many people remember seeing a cable news show that didn't have three different crawl screens going across the bottom? I mean, we've all become normalized to this. I mean, what would you say, um, if you were a sitcom writer uh, and you wanted to be the kind of anti-Hannah anti Montana writer, what kind of show could you see? Um, would there possibly be a show that you could, you could use as a critique of this, of this trend that we're in the middle of right now? Uh, I, I actually think that we see in a lot of popular culture and a lot of movies and TV the, the recognition of the dangers of overuse, the obnoxiousness in public places, uh, the you know, new, news reports uh, about, about things. I mean, people, people are recognizing we're, we're sort of past that, that period of hype and enthusiasm so that there has been a, a skepticism setting in about too much time, too much texting, too much with that cell phone, quiet cars now in, 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 in the trains, uh, for instance, or you know, people laughing in London, they had to start wrapping uh, rubber padding around the light posts and the street lights because people were like this and they were running into the street poles and they were banging their heads and having head, you know, this, this was, but this became a joke uh, when, when they see, so I think things are shaking out. We're, 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 we're finding uh, middle ground uh, between recognizing all the amazing convenience and the miraculous uh, breakthroughs and then seeing some of the human costs, some of the human losses of, say, time alone, solitude. Solitude is disappearing for, for young people. They don't like being alone, uh, just naturally, a lot of them, and now they have the tools not to be alone, so they never have to learn how to be alone. And learning to be alone is a fundamental condition of adulthood, uh, I think. But uh, the, the recognition of those dangers, when one, one, one sees you know, in, in, I can't think of specific examples, but in sitcoms, you know, the, the, young, the young youth all wired in and, 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 and gabbing on the phone and so, so on. So that, that there is that awareness. Uh, but the normalization process uh, pushes that middle ground way too far <laughs> away from some of the older poles such as uh, uh, family, family meals, long family meals with no interruptions. That includes the TV on, no text messaging, their conversation at, at the table. Uh, time in the morning with the newspaper there at the breakfast table and some discussion of, of current events. Uh, or regarding the 13-year-old the sitting in a chair with a book for two hours, not as an unusual or potentially weird condition. Uh, that, that's, I think, where cultural conservatives uh, have to regard themselves as waging a little bit of a, a culture, not a culture war, maybe a, a culture skirmish, pushing back and trying to preserve uh, those uh, those better cultural behaviors and conditions that are are under threat from the uh, from from digital age mores, and, and and also yeah, adults love these tools. Parents love these tools often because the tools are a babysitter. You know the parents. You're 50 years old. You're wondering about your life. You're thinking about that high school sweetheart, and yeah, you you know the the nostalgia. So the appeal to parents is is very strong for these tools. Yes.